everybody. I'm going to wait for a minute if you guys want to come and find a seat. Maybe you can grab something. There's a little bit over here and a little over there. So hi, thank you for uh, coming to this talk. Thank you for coming before lunch. I know everyone's probably a little hungry. So let's get started. My name is Vivian and I've been working in ad agencies for about 14 years now. Um, I've been producing web and mobile campaigns. I work with major brands and I work with Fortune 500 companies. And currently, I work at Google. And I think you guys might know Google, but you might not know AdWords. So today, I'm gonna cover five key project management principles that you can bring to your work. And we use these five principles all the time at Google. Um, they're actually really common in project management, and the challenges that my designers face are very similar, even though you know, I'm at Google, but every product design team kind of experiences these, pro these problems and these challenges. Um, I'm guessing that the audience is mostly designers. Can I see a show of hands? If you are a designer and you are facing the struggle, yes, okay. So I'm going to show you, as a designer, how to be really buttoned up from the project kickoff, even if you work in a large or small company with a ton of work on your plate, um, and you can really understand your team and understand your roadblocks and anticipate some of the major challenges that you really face as a designer every day. So these are the five principles I'm going to cover today. Let's go through them. Number one, identify your stakeholders. Number two, own success criteria. Number three, track all the things. Number four is embrace change. And number five, be the UX champion. So as I mentioned, I work on AdWords. A lot of people don't really know what AdWords is, so I'm going to give you some background on the product so you know the scale of work that um, the design team faces every day. So AdWords is Google's flagship advertising platform. It makes almost all of Google's money and it's not just one product, it's actually a platform of four separate products. This is an example of the AdWords interface. Pretty dry, but um, it's a tool that's created for businesses to really uh, start their marketing campaigns, and it's very complex. Within this little tool, there's over 100 projects happening each quarter, and within each project, there's multiple work streams that are going on. So, the scale of the work requires so much organization, and I'm the only producer on the, on the team, and about 35 designers total. So here's a sample of what you see in a typical AdWords campaign. Um, let's say you want to buy a pet chicken, but you don't just want to go and buy any chicken, you want a silky chicken. That's what, that's what that is, it's really cute. Um, so you go online and you Google it, and if you're a business and you sell silky chickens, you can advertise directly to the people who are Googling them through the AdWords interface. And if you can't see that ad, if you're in the back, it's a real ad, and it says, top colors with great personalities will ship as few as five chickens. So there's a lot of advertisers on this, on this platform, over a few million, and this little sidebar is really just to tell you the complexity of the product and how much scale uh, we need to have as both designers and how the product needs to scale as well. So let's get into the principles. Uh, principle number one, identify your stakeholders. This is a core product team at Google. We've got three people, the product manager, the engineer, and the UX design lead. There's also qualitative and quantitative researchers, but let's just focus on these three for now. So I recommend get to know them, get lunch with them, and if you can, communicate with them daily. But communication at scale in a huge organization is so tough. It's one of the biggest challenges that we have. So at Google, we use all the same tools that are available to you. We have Google Docs, and we can start threads and comment in the document, share them, get it going, get the conversation really moving. Uh, we also use Gchat, of course, I'm sure you guys use something like that. And we also use Hangouts, and Hangouts can be really helpful for um, sharing work and screen sharing when you're not local with your team. So we also use email a ton. I think that's what we use the most. It's because at scale, you really want to respond quickly 
and um, it's the best way to get inside your team members and heads and see what they're doing. Um, but I recommend these tools, just these are what we use, but you know, get your core set of tools and use them for communication nonstop. And really, it's, it's the most important thing for having your, like, uh, your team on board with what is going on with the work in progress. And I also recommend set up some regular work in progress check-ins on the calendar. I'm thinking daily scrums, you guys know those, stand-ups, um, more formal kind of design reviews, and then start to build their trust. Get that regular cadence of meetings going. So involving your product manager and your engineers early is going to help you gain their trust, and it's going to help you avoid going down roads that you might not know about or you might not have any insight into. Um, your team needs to have a voice when you start designing and concepting. And I really recommend you get to know how your team works and what they need to look good so you can look good as well. And once the project is kicked off, that's when it's really time to collaborate with them and engage them. Um, build your consensus on the behavior that you're designing for and make it really clear what you're not designing for as well. I think that conversation is really important. Um, so I wanted to give a real life example from my personal experience uh, for one of these principles. If everybody can think back, maybe you're a new designer, but maybe you've had a few projects under your belt. Perhaps you had a project that didn't go so well. Um, maybe relive that moment right now, that kind of nightmare where maybe something launched late or everything changed in the goals. So I'll talk a little bit about a uh, favorite nightmare project of mine. And as I'm talking through it, just think back to that awful project that you went through. Um, so a former client, which I'm not going to name, put my team and I through a typical nightmare project. It was absolute hell. We worked mornings, we worked nights, we worked weekends, and this was about a month straight, and we were so stressed out, we were about to kill each other. And, you know, when you're working on a tight team, you really need that support of your team, right? So, we worked so hard to show our client all this progress, and by the time we finally got to our client's boss, our client's boss took a look at it and killed the entire project. So, demoralizing, depressing. Uh, totally sucked, but <laughs> what, what really went wrong here? Um, I think that a couple things went wrong. One, it's really important to identify who's looking at your work and who's going to approve it right off the bat. That's the first part. So our client didn't get buy-in from her stakeholder, so we looked bad and we threw a bunch of work out the window. Um, the second one is if, she, if the client's not going to show the work to their stakeholders, you need to insist that you're going to meet that person and get their buy-in right off the bat. Even if it's an initial concept, involve them at the very start. It's so important. And my third point here is let the client's stakeholders, let their bosses, shape the work with you as you go. Because then they feel like they own it. They feel like they've contributed. They don't feel like they've um, been left out of the whole process. So this kind of brings us to my second principle. And that's own and drive the project's success criteria. Um, I think this means work with your stakeholders and create a clear document up front. It could be a project requirements doc, it could be um, just a brief, it could be a one-pager. These things are really good because you get approval on what you're working on, the specific problem, and the attainable, measurable goals, and how to get there. So, you know, ask your team, what's the, what are we doing? Why are we, why are we working on this? What needle are we trying to move? Um, are we trying to increase user satisfaction, make them happy by 80%, or are we trying to increase click-throughs? So figure out what's measurable, and then get your team to approve this document, just a goals document, really straightforward. But get them to approve it before you even dig into anything. It's so important to understand what the requirements of the product are and have that be separate from what the design needs to do, right? So once you've gotten that document approved, over-communicate. Um, you know your stakeholders now, and update them on all the changes that you're doing, and it's really important for them to feel involved and feel, feel loved and feel like at these regular checkpoints that you're setting up, you know, the scrums, the stand-ups, um, the, the workshops, I think those are really helpful and cool that they're involved. So at these scheduled checkpoints, you're going to want to use principle three, track all the things. Um, I like to standardize the way I work, but I start working with teams. 
and I'm more of the operations person, so I like the designers to really focus on design, but there are some, some of these kind of typical project management boring 101 things, but it's really helpful. So I recommend create a feedback tracker. In your feedback tracker, I like to list the name of the person who's giving me feedback, my comments on their feedback, like is this doable, is this undoable for this version, and list the date that you work on it and that you talked about it. Um, I think it's not fancy, but it's also important to list if this person's feedback is a must-have for this iteration or if it can wait for another release in the future. Um, and I think it's, it's important to also check it off and share this with your, with your stakeholders, with the people who are giving you feedback, and be very transparent with how you're working and how you're progressing. So um, if you're holding a more formal design review, try to identify someone else who can take notes for you, because that's gonna free up your hands so you can have a conversation about the design and someone else is helping you capture all that knowledge and all that feedback and keep moving it forward. Um, hopefully, you're also conducting research, so definitely take notes during your research studies, even if your stakeholders can't be there. Um, I think that this will help to kind of give you knowledge and power, and then you can impart that knowledge to your team members. Um, it's really, really nice, and it's going to help you own the relationship, so you can validate what you're working on and really create an ironclad case for your designs. So if your stakeholders are giving you a lot of brief, you can say, well, look, we did a research study, and we proved that this is exactly how we want to have the design. Okay, we're at number four. Embrace change. Um, this is one of my favorite ones as a project manager slash producer because you kind of have to be very comfortable with chaos and how things evolve. So I think you need to be flexible. And even though you've created a really nice requirements document and you shared it with everyone and you got your, you got your approval and all the stakeholders love it, things just change. So maybe you get into it a little more and you're parallel pathing, working with engineers, and you find out that the tech stack is completely different. Or you find out that um, based on some situation beyond your control, maybe the deadline changed. Um, also at a large organization, this happens all the time, you get a brand new set of stakeholders and they don't have any clue what you've been working on and they don't really care. So it's really important to involve these people um, and be flexible. As you get these issues and as they come up, it's really important to address them and not put it in a bucket for a future release because it could actually make your problems better and you could have some of these challenges and you could figure out a better way to create a cooler user experience or a faster one. Or if the tech stack is different, you can address that right away and make something that's faster and work closer with the engineers. So it can help surface a lot of issues the more flexible you are. And number five, be the UX champion. So I don't mean after all these steps, it's now when you should step in and be like, I'm the boss, I know what's up. You should be having the UX champion kind of flow through all of these steps, because you're the designer, you're trying to have the best, clearest user experience for your, design, for your users. Um, I think that you're the UX lead on the project, and being the UX champion is something that really shows through all five of these steps. So designers really should own the entire design process, in my opinion, but you might have to fight to make it legitimate, and you might have to fight to get respect. I think this happens a lot. Um, design is really well respected at Google, but it was not always a company priority. Um, it's only very recently where uh, it's kind of come out and it's been a lot more respected. So it's been an interesting evolution for sure, but I really think that design ownership comes from the top of the company all the way down, and that's why I have to partner with your stakeholders. Um, as a designer, it can be really hard to get a seat at the table if you work in an organization that might be run by engineers like Google, or it might be run by salespeople. Um, a lot of the time you're reporting to marketing people who don't really understand the design process. So these are common problems. Um, I think it can be really frustrating across the board. So I can just recommend that you communicate often with them, constantly over communicate. And again, validate your work through quantitative and qualitative research where you can. I know it's not always doable because of scope of projects, but it's really important to get that buy-in and, like I said, create a very ironclad case for your designs and for your work and for the whole entire process. So let's recap. Are you guys ready for the five principles? Do you guys remember them? One, identify your stakeholders. 
Two, own the success criteria. Three, track all the things. Four, embrace change. And five, be the UX champion. So it's really hard as a, produ as a producer slash project manager to get up in front of a bunch of UX designers and tell you all the principles of project management. Uh, it's only 15 minutes, so it's a very short talk. But um, I think it's really important to at least try to select one of these and I don't think that one is more important than the other. I've just seen these in my career. These are really common roadblocks and obstacles that my team has been through that I've seen for a long time. Um, but if you can take just one back to the office on Monday, I think it's really gonna help you and maybe mix up how you work, maybe you didn't do one of these before. I think it's gonna be really nice to help circumvent some of the major roadblocks that my designers and a lot of you guys probably face. Yeah, and I have some time for questions. Yay. Yay. Uh, let me see your hands. Right up in the sky. Good. Good. Hi. Hey. Great talk for the presentation. Uh, one question regarding the AdWords specifically. Uh, it's a very complex platform, you know? a huge amount of, of features. Yeah. Uh, is, is there a, way, a limit? I mean, uh, a moment when you say, no, we cannot fit, uh, fit any more than this? Uh, so the question is, can we, can we say no? And we have to say no, but it's a matter of how we say no. Um, it's something that the designers really had a hard time saying no to because they don't want to be the bad guy in the situation. Um, it was something that was really helpful when I started, started on the team earlier this year because this way I can look at things like resourcing and see how many designers are on the team, see how many features we have, scope the features, and really figure out how many, this is a little bit science, like boring science, but how many hours are in a financial quarter? So I think there's, if we think of each designer working each quarter 13 weeks, um, it's a little bit boring, but you're working about 420 hours a quarter. So what I did from there is I broke down each project request and have small, medium, and large kind of scoping. And I work very closely with the designers and the design leads to figure out what can be doable in those 420 hours and what's not doable and what's the priority within those projects. So my tip would be, one, prioritize, two, scope as accurately as possible, and three, hire a producer. Because <laughs> it can be really helpful to not be the person having the conversations. So that way you can rely on actual data and say, no, we can't do this because we only have 12 designers on this group and everyone's fully booked. So how are you going to slot that in for later? And in addition to saying no, you can say, well, what can we work on first? Um, one thing that I really like to do is if it's a bigger project, extra large or large, um, I try to break it up into what can we do first? Can we work on the framework while engineers are also working on the back end? Because you don't need to give the work to your engineers with rounded corners and perfect typography. You can do all that stuff later. So I figure out what can be unblocking for the engineering team or whoever needs to do what they need to do. Um, perhaps like just really high level stuff at first and then get into more uh, high fidelity mocks. Yeah. Yeah. Hi Virginia. Thanks for the talk. Vivian. Vivian. Okay. <laughs> right. <laughs> Worse. Um, I would like to know how much time you spend on documenting while, while processing and how much do you use it as an automized pro process? Yeah, um, very little is automized in terms of documentation. I think that we automate a few things. We automate, um, we automate a little bit of like red lines. We have a few templates that, that I work with my designers on because it's a huge project, huge platform, very complex. Um, the designers work with some very similar components across the platform, so that's kind of the most automated process. Engineering is working with a lot of automation as well, but in terms of other automation, I mean, documentation is kind of one by one. Each core product team works on all of their requirements themselves, and it's really a feature track kind of very lean model where people are creating things that work well, one, with the whole group, but it also works individually with each feature. So it's kind of like what we look at what matches the whole group and all the components, and if it doesn't match, are we creating something new and unique, or are we creating something that um, we need to document for like a brand new component? 
Does that answer your question? Okay, cool. Another one over here, over here. Yeah, I know that this guy. Hey. Uh, you're just telling us uh, how Google didn't always have a design front and center. Uh, and I was wondering, uh, as Google coming from a software focus or IT centric background, uh, what would you say be a, or, or had been a, a pivotal moment in which uh, experience started to take, uh, to, to come forward and, and to be taken as part of the core? Yeah, I think that's a great question. At what moment did Google start to notice that design was very important? Um, I know you guys are very familiar with the Google.com search, which has been super simple and beautiful for, for years, since 2001. But I think the moment really happened when we realized how late we were to the game with mobile. Um, mobile has really been what pushes what's currently going on at Google and with design, and we're starting to actually focus on being aware of transitions and being aware of touch targets and being aware of the things that people should be able to, the things that make people uh, view Google and reach the most users and the most customers. Um, and that includes also accessibility. So that's a big core component of what we're working on right now. And accessibility is so, so close to what we do um, on AdWords we actually scored a big fat zero for accessibility this past uh, year, which is really embarrassing and all we can do is move up from there. So there's a lot of design that we're pushing and we're really having to be the advocates and the leaders with the engineers and with the product managers, so. Thanks. Well, thank you, Vivian. Thank, thank you, you guys a lot. Um,